Mr Howard, good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Is the Liberal Party in danger of splitting into two parties? No, that's absolutely not going to happen. Uh, the Liberal Party is uh, obviously going through a difficult time at the moment, but I'm still convinced that we can win the next federal election. And I think one of the things people have got to understand is that there's a long history in Australian politics of a disconnect between uh, a heavy defeat at a state level and victory at a federal level. I experienced it twice. 2001, at the beginning of the year, we were wiped out in Queensland and lost in Western Australia. Yet at the end of the year, we held office. 2004, the same thing. We had a terrible outcome in Queensland. We won at the end of the year. And if you want a bit of history, you can go back to uh, the origin of the word, uh, you know, rudd slide or ran slide. It was the ran slide in 19... 19- 78, where Neville Rand got 57% of the primary vote in New South Wales, yet that was sandwiched between uh, two very strong federal victories in New South Wales by the Fraser government. So I'd say to Liberal supporters, understandably depressed at what happened in Victoria, I think it was overwhelmingly for state reasons. And can I give credit where it's due? I think Daniel Andrews was a very good campaigner. I think he's an extremely good communicator. He explains things clearly, simply and well. And Victoria's had a history for quite some years now, some decades, in fact, of being slightly more to the centre-left, the Massachusetts of Australia, some people call it, than the rest of the country. When you look at the Liberal Party broadly, though, the Victorian state election result is just one of a number of things that's gone on. We've had centrist independents elected in a number of um, formerly coalition seats, uh, Indi, Wentworth, Mayo among them. We've had today a federal Liberal MP defect to sit on the crossbench as an independent. We've had numerous Liberal MPs publicly share their concerns about the direction of the party. You've got ageing and declining membership. There were money troubles. Malcolm Turnbull had to chip in at the last election. Why do all of those things, when you take them together, not signal a crisis in the state of the Liberal Party? Well, one of the reasons why it doesn't um, suggest a crisis is that on all the fundamentals, the federal Liberal government is doing well. And the Prime Minister announced today that we're going to have a surplus budget next year. Now, when you consider the mess we inherited five years ago, that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, Our national security credentials protecting the borders of first class We're facing a Labor opposition that has built the daylights out of the thrifty middle class of Australia with a whole lot of new taxes. I mean, when you look at the fundamentals uh, nationally, we've got a very good story to tell. Sure, we're disappointed about what happened in Victoria, but one of the things we have to do uh, is not automatically extrapolate that into the federal scene. There are separately challenges federally, I accept that, and they have to be addressed, but... The last thing we should do is to allow our political opponents to define us ideologically. Well, on the point of how the Liberal Party should be defined ideologically, we know that Australian society has changed quite a bit since you uh, left politics 11 years ago. It's changed an enormous amount since you became Prime Minister. Would you agree that the Liberal Party has to adapt to stay relevant? And if so, how should the party present itself in 2018? Well, I think all political parties have got to remain relevant and they can't live in the past, of course. But when I describe the Liberal Party as a broad church, what I say is that it's the custodian of two Liberal traditions. One of them is the classical Liberal one and the other is the Conservative one. It doesn't mean that the Liberal Party is made up half of classical Liberals and half of Conservatives. I mean, I am a mixture of the two. I'm a classical Liberal on economic issues. That's why I believe in labour market deregulation. That's why I believe in lower taxes, smaller government. That's why I'm against tariff protection. Adam Smith, if he were alive today, uh, would agree with all of those positions. But on other issues, such as the monarchy uh, and and the attitude I took on same-sex marriage, which the public disagreed with, anyway, that's behind us now, uh, I'm more conservative. But And that applies to most of us. But the one thing we mustn't do is to allow our political enemies and commentators to start describing people um, specifically as a classical liberal or a conservative. But it's not in... This, sorry to interrupt, Stow, but it's not in no. this case your political enemies. It's people from within the yeah, party. Well, well, I, well, my warning is for those people not to allow 
people who are not friendly to us as a Liberal collective to define us. So I hear expressions like hard right. I mean, what's meant by hard right? Somebody who's got a conservative social position? That's not hard right. It's well, just, just being an ordinary conservative who sees value in preserving things from the past that are working well. There's nothing hard right about that. It's just common sense. Well, let me put to you uh, what the Senate President, Scott Ryan, said yesterday about his view that he wanted, like you say, the Liberal Party to be a broad church. Mm. He said, we don't want litmus tests that you've somehow got to adopt this position, particularly on social issues, and if you don't, you're not a real Liberal. Haven't we seen evidence of that taking hold, that people in, in one side of the party say that the other side, they're not real Liberals? Well, I think, I think some people have fallen for that on both sides. I mean, some people are running around saying the only real Liberal uh, is somebody who agrees with this and this. You don't want any of that. And, and people who foolishly say, oh, what Bob Menzies would have said. Now, you talk about moving on. I mean, I admire all Liberals do Bob Menzies. He founded our party and governed for 16 brilliant years. But uh, the world in the 1950s and 60s was quite different from the world that I was Prime Minister in and the world that now operates. But in the end... Uh, the Liberal Party is a broad church. It's a broad church of people who hold classical Liberal views and conservative views. And most of us, my experience has been that we are each a mixture of the two. I certainly was and remain. And I'm sure that's the case with Scott Morrison. And I'm sure it was the case with uh, uh, his two predecessors as Liberal leaders. Julia Banks, as I said before, resigned from the Liberal Party today to sit on the crossbench. How do you rate Scott Morrison's chances of being able to hold on for an election next May? Well, I think Scott's got the capacity to do that and uh, I wish him well in that endeavour. I obviously don't know much about Julia Banks uh, except that I did campaign for her uh, in her marginal seat of Chisholm and she, like me, owes a lot to the Liberal Party. I mean, I would never have achieved anything in politics without the Liberal Party. I owe the Liberal Party so much. And I think it's always important for uh, people who are elected to Parliament, whether it's on the Labor side or our side, to remember that they are overwhelmingly there because of their patronage from their own party and they should never forget that. On the point of loyalty um, to the party, what do you think of the way that Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull have behaved post-leadership? Look, I'm not going to give a commentary on that. That doesn't help anybody. When Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister, I supported him 100%. When Malcolm Turnbull was the Prime Minister, I supported him. And uh, I, I believe I retain the friendship of both men. But now Scott Morrison is there, I'm going to give him total support because I want him to win. I believe it will be better for Australia if he does. And I want all of the members of the Liberal Party to, to bear in mind the importance of working together. Don't get too despairing about what happened in Victoria. Can I ask your opinion on a couple of policy mm. matters? The former Deputy Leader Julie Bishop says the Prime Minister Scott Morrison should make a deal with Labor on the National Energy Guarantee, the policy the Coalition initially put forward, <clears throat> um, that it's the only bipartisan hope for energy policy and that would give business the certainty it needs for investment. What do you think? Well, I'm not going to complicate the challenges Scott Morrison has at present time by buying into that. Uh, that's a matter for the party room to debate. The, the one observation I would make uh, is that this country, in my opinion, made a mistake some years ago when it invested so many taxpayer subsidies and inducements into renewables and it distorted the market such that it became less competitive for traditional sources of power and energy to operate. Now, whether uh, that can be dealt with at this stage in the argument, and, and I say all of that as a bit of an agnostic, I have to confess, I've confessed that before, uh, on climate change, but as to the working out of the current policy, I'll leave that to the Prime Minister. Do you think the Australian Embassy in Israel should be moved to Jerusalem? Look, I'm personally in favour, and I've said this before, of our embassy being in Jerusalem because Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. You don't worry about the cost to the relationship, uh, say, with Indonesia? No, no, but, no, but in, you, hang on, in the end, this is a matter between Australia uh, and, and Israel, and the idea that other countries should, you know, micromanage uh, our foreign policy. I don't think people would find that acceptable. Now, as to the priority or otherwise of when it should happen, that's another matter. That's a matter for the, for the government to determine. If you've asked me as an issue of principle, I've said before on the public record that I support it because uh, 
I think it's logical to have it in the capital and, and also because I have enormous respect for the fact uh, of what Israel has achieved and also the fact that it's the one true great democracy in the Middle East. Mr Howard, thanks for your time. Pleasure.